Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Well, it is, um, it is really a pleasure to get to be one of the kickoff speakers for this conference. And um, I want to commend the organizers for putting together a really amazing event. I understand. I understand that um, it is sold out and they've accommodated beyond sold out. So um, I, I'd love to just suggest we give them all a hand because they've put a, done a terrific job for this. Great, great, thank you. Well, I'm only gonna add a little bit to what Holly mentioned in my background just to kind of give perspective of kind of my view on this topic. And what I will mention is that when I, um, I I've been really fortunate to work full-time in animal welfare since 95, and I consider myself very blessed to be able to have done that. Um, I spent a bunch of years before that volunteering on the boards of shelters and with spay-neuter groups. And when I got the chance to first work professionally to go to the American Humane Association, the very first thing I really wanted them to do was create marketing materials for pediatric spay-neuter because I was coming from the field where a lot of folks didn't know anything about that, even though AVMA, AAHA, and others had a lot of very supportive policies about that. So I've, I've been involved in kind of the spay-neuter field for a long, long time, and I am a huge fan of spay-neuter, um, as is our organization. In fact, my heroes in this field are folks like Leslie Appel and many of the folks that I'm, I'm uh, privileged to be here with that are, are really creating the kind of Olympiads of spay neuter. Um, and I'll talk to you about why I'm so passionate about the, the topic I'm going to talk to you about today. When I was able to go to PetSmart Charities and enter the world of, of the funding, the funding uh, audience, there's, there's this elation that comes about the six, first six months of being able to give out money for the, what I used to do an awful lot of job you know, fundraising for. Um, and then you start realizing, wow, we're, we're really not making a dent. Despite the millions of dollars that PetSmart Charities was able to give out, there was so much demand, especially in the area, for spay-neuter. So I started early on thinking, we need a smarter way to be able to reach more broadly than we can. I, when I left PetSmart Charities, I had a couple of passions and I've been really fortunate to be able to work full time for, for a number of years now on create, helping us create new tools beyond surgical sterilization that will let us reach farther in this country. And as we all become increasingly kind of globally oriented, I recognize how necessary those are around the world. I, I was fortunate to really work a lot with shelters around the country when I was at American Humane and PetSmart Charities. Come on in. And um, I tried to really keep connected to the local level with, with uh, my volunteer work with the Animal Shelter Alliance of Portland. There we run um, Spay and Save, which uh, does about 10,000 uh, cat spay and neuters for, uh, at, at a low cost for people on limited, uh, limited income. And we've seen what a difference that that incre incremental sterilization has done for the community. You heard mentioned we've brought our euthanasia down by 71%. And recently, we're very fortunate to get a, a Maddie's life saving grant there in Portland. Um, and, but we've also seen how difficult that is year after year to be able to raise enough money to continue because it's a very, it's a very costly program to do. So, anyway, so that's a little bit about me. And now I want to encourage you, despite what this says, <laughs> to actually think a bit outside, perhaps outside what is your box this morning. Um, and I'd like to know a little bit about you as an audience. So I, I know this is in the DVM LVT track. Can I see how many of you are, are veterinarians? Whoa, <laughs> this is intimidating. <laughs> and, and how many of you are, are LVTs or vet techs? How many of you aren't one of those professionals? Okay, a smattering of you. Okay, well, I'm a little intimidated now. I am not a veterinarian, and I, I don't even try to play one on TV. I, uh, I um, am, am a really earnest student of many on our, uh, our governing board and our advisory board that are, including my colleagues on the board, Dr. Uh, Bob Whedon, here a veterinarian, and um, Amy Fisher, who is a PhD in animal sciences. So, so I'm sure they will speak up if I mis misspeak in this presentation, and I encourage any of you to do so as well, or I'll help direct your, your questions to them. So, um, 
So here are my objectives for our hour here today. Um, I'm going to give you, oh, let me, let me start by, so how many of you have been to a presentation on this topic or have read about it before? Okay, so maybe like a third or half of you. And the rest of you, I'm assuming this is pretty new, this is a pretty new topic for you. Okay, I, I'm used to this kind of a mixed audience and, it's, uh, and I will apologize in advance because it's hard to provide enough of the new and cool information for those of you who have got a good grounding on it as well as catch up folks who are hearing about it for the first time. So we'll, we'll try to hit a happy medium. Um, I'm going to talk about the overview of efforts to develop non-surgical tools for cats and dogs. Can it give you some of the hot updates on what I'll call nearer-term technologies being trialed. Because those are things that you're going to be hearing about as veterinarians, as professionals in this field. Um, and I'm still going to touch on some really neat things that are in the works for longer time, like Dr. Mark Thompson here with Found Animals Foundation is, is really working on. Um, this is an important time for our field because we're about to have Zuterin as a tool. In fact, we actually have it now that we can actually work with. And so typically, <clears throat> I speak a fair bit about that because it's a, it's a tool to use here and now. The second hour of this morning is going to be Dr. Bob Whedon doing a great job on that. So I'm going to leave that pretty much for him and, and be here to uh, kind of give a sense of what ACCD's perspective on it is on it as part of mine. And we'll talk a little bit about what I call related topics, which are questions that always come up early on, which are things like, well, when we've non-surgically treated an animal, how are we going to identify them or mark them to know that's been done? You know? and, and how do we know we're making an impact in, uh, in population, whether we're using surgery or non-surgical tools. That's things that ACCD has been working on. So I don't need to tell any of you that spay spaying and neutering is a tremendous tool, but it takes a lot of moving parts. It takes your very skilled, highly educated, indebted <laughs> to academia uh, background. It takes, uh, it takes uh, a sterile field. It takes uh, uh, intake area, recovery space. And when you add that all up, it's, it's, it can be challenging to deliver, especially if your aim is to do three times as much of it as you're currently doing. So, so out of the challenges of that, even among those of you who have become, like Dr. Whedon and others, kind of Olympiads of spay neuter, out of the challenges of that, that our, our um, aspirations come. So our you can see our mission right here. I'm not going to... Um, read it to you. You can read it, but it is, we're pretty, pretty focused on helping advance this one area because we feel it can make a big difference. And so we have priorities for what it is that we are looking for that would actually fit our needs. And for a non-surgical sterilant or contraceptive, we're looking for something obviously that is safe and effective, both for animals and for, for humans and for the, and for the environment. It has to be that to pass any kind of regulatory approval for us to be able to use it. So that's obviously key. We started off feeling, you know, we, we really want something that's permanent, and we very much still would love to see a permanent solution, especially as a, a good adjunct tool to, to surgery. I would say I have, and I think our organization has become much more interested, however, in what I would call long-term contraceptives. Um, for the animal welfare field, in part because of the lifespan of some of the animals that are the neediest. You know, international dogs, you know, roaming dogs, uh, feral free roaming cats in this country. We've come to the idea that something that could last three to five years could be really, really helpful for us. Um, in addition, at our event, a big event we had a couple weeks ago, we had speakers um, from outside our sphere, not yours as, as uh, if you're involved in private practice veterinarians. We had people from um, the world of kind of cat fancy, the world of, of working dogs and uh, competitive dogs. And it was really eye-opening to see the high interest they have for a range of reasons in something that could be a temporary contraceptive that could be reversible at a point when they've determined, yes, a dog would be a good breeding stock would be one that they would want to contribute to the gene pool. You know, same thing for cats. Um, or, or because of some of the issues they see in some of the new research about surgical sterilization, they feel might be, um, help have their animals become a little bit less competitive. So it was really, it was an interesting perspective. 
We're hopeful for one treatment. Um, that's, I would say, speaking from an organization with, a, with a, an animal welfare orientation, oftentimes, and certainly you, those of you involved in shelter medicine, you only get one chance to treat the animal. Um, you know, it may be that for other purposes, something that would bring an animal in for regular exams, you know, might be a good thing, you know, given that we have fewer vaccines to, to bring them in to make sure that they're, they're doing well from a health standpoint. But generally, we'd like something to be one treatment. There, the topic of health and behavior um, is, is a very big one. And um, what we are clear is that we need to understand both the baseline of what surgical sterilization provides for, for, um, uh, um, for health benefits, for non-reproductive effects in health and behavior, and we need to be able to compare what these new technologies will do to that so we can see where they, where they fit. And affordable. We've determined that affordable can be pretty different depending on if you're in India, if you're in Long Island, you know, but in general, we need these options to be affordable because of our desire to be able to get them to animals who are otherwise going, not going to be treated. So what, do, what does ACCND do? We, because a lot of people ask that, what is your role in this movement? One of the key things, we, we encourage scientific advancement. I'm gonna give you a couple examples. We just had, about two weeks ago, our fifth international symposium, um, which was an incredible event, really, really neat. And I'm gonna give you some highlights from that symposium. I know, our, obviously, our board member's there, but I don't see anybody else in the room, I think, was at the symposium. Can you raise your hand if somebody else was there with that? Good, so I can bring you some highlights of, of that. We are going to, all of, it was two days of presentations on this topic, um, a lot of new information, and everything was, all the, the presentations were recorded into PowerPoint and are gonna be on our website by, in about a week or two. So as you listen to this, if there's areas you're more interested in, you can go in and kind of specifically look at a specific topic and hear more about that. You can see we had attendees from all over the world, and to, to kind of summarize this in, in a bit less detail, about a quarter of the people were from what I would call the animal sheltering world. About a quarter were veterinarians in shelter medicine or private practice. Um, about a quarter were scientists in either academia or in business that were working on inventing these. And then about a quarter of the attendees were people that were either, you know, funders in public health um, or the 21% who would not be categorized. So this is Dr. Um, Dr. Thoya from Kenya who's been using uh, Asterisol in a rabies program over there. This is Dr. Barron from Turkey who is working on inventing new sterilants. Really, really interesting group and I encourage you if you have more interest in this to, to delve there because we'll only touch on a you know, tiny a bit of the information that was shared. So that symposium is divided into two tracks, and one we call the discovery science, which is people who are looking on inventing new ways or advancing ways of uh, creating infertility in dogs and cats. And then there's the implementation track. Something else ACCND does is, is do think tanks on specific topics that we can delve into, and that that does a couple things. It bring, helps bring new people into the field, often from really relevant areas, but that have had no, no dealings with veterinary medicine, for example. Um, one example is we had, um, these are the three think tanks we've done in the discovery area. One example is, um, is a fabulous set of folks that are working on gene silencing where you can target um, human disease that are repro um, not reproductive um, diseases that are uh, neurologically uh, neurological disease and target the genes that are responsible for them. They're looking at how you can shut down the action of that gene and therefore cure or prevent the disease. These folks are now looking in the whole area of reproduction if you can look at where you could shut down certain reproduction genes. It's it's interesting place. We have people, we have doctors that are working on cancer for humans that are looking at targeting T cells and looking to see if they can use some of these targets. They're, they're finding that some of the side effects in what they're doing may be um, loss of fertility. 
not a good thing when you're trying to treat a human for cancer, but perhaps something that has utility elsewhere. So you can find these also on our, our website, uh, outcome reports from these think tanks. And these are two in implementation science that we'll be talking about later, one about population dynamics and one about how to mark animals. So we help advance promising technologies, and you're going to hear <laughs> a bit about Dr. Whedon's, one of, that's one of his missions as a board member uh, and a, a veterinarian is to be able to help advance uh, Zuterin, which we think offers a lot, of, uh, a lot of opportunity for this field, and we are eager to see this first tool get well used to, uh, to reach more dogs and to help shelters and veterinarians kind of um, be able to treat more animals through the, the cost and the time saving that it provides. We develop, we disseminate information. This is, this is a reference for all of this as well. We just launched this about two months ago. It's a 150 page ebook that really talks in detail about this field and all the, new, the things that are going on. This is downloadable for free at ACCND. So if you've got questions, um, certainly I can try to, uh, myself and our board members can help answer them at the end, but this may be also a good resource to, to go to. We have product profiles and position statements you can read about um, very much based on, um, on sound science. You can read about um, products and, and technologies that either, you know, just re remember us as a resource when things come up that you hear about and you want to go. Okay, and, and we build alliances with stakeholders. So this, I want to just give you a snapshot of our board of directors. It's, it's really important that this field draws in um, professionals from a variety of areas. Veterinarians, obviously, um, uh, people from the animal health field, the science scientists, and animal welfare organizations. And these aren't, and, and leaders, and these aren't always people that work together naturally. So our board really creates kind of a, a, a combination of folks that are seeding that that networking. This is um, our, our primary uh, uh, sponsors and, and supporters are these organizations <coughs> who have made a, a multi-year commitment of funding to ACC and D and we work with closely um, as kind of for strategic guidance and to reach out into the field. So it gives you a bit of a snapshot of, of us and beyond that we have about 140 organizational partners. These range from everything from Cornell Vet, Sco Vet School who is one of our first to the AVMA, uh, to animal welfare groups all over the world, to individual veterinary practices. They're essentially saying, this is important, we, this needs to be an advanced, we're with you, you know, kind of in uh, kind of moral support. And as I mentioned, we explore and we advance related needs. So, so one of the first questions I get is, so non-surgical sterilization, so like what, what is it? And I, I don't need to, to uh, tell this group about what you're, you're seeing here. The thing, there is no simple one it is the, the question. You know, this is the mammalian reproductive cycle and there are actually a lot of different ways to interfere with that. And what you'll see is some of the things we'll be talking about today actually interfere at different places from the, you know, the, the pulsatile initial release of GnRH, kind of the master reproductive hormone cascading down to the pituitary with FSH and LH going down either, either to the ovaries or the, the testes. There's different ways that you can interfere and of course depending on how you interfere with that you may get different results in terms of, of whether you're interfering with, uh, with sexual behaviors. Um, you know, if, you know, so, so we're going to talk a little bit about that but there are um, a number of different it's. So what's, so we're going to talk a little like what's available now? And these are kind of the four categories are going to, I'm going to talk about. Um, some of which are in our target area for something that will, that will really serve our needs best and some of which aren't. There's hormonal contraceptives, there's agonist implants, chemical castration as in Zuterin and, and vaccines and tests. So, so a brief history about hormonal contraceptives for, for dogs and cats. So back in, you know, 1960 is when the pill was launched here in the United States for women. And there had been a lot of research over the years toward that happening. 
Um, some of it was animal research. Some of it was very much geared toward the human application, but others of it was actually geared toward being at, at able to work in dogs and or cats. Um, one of the early versions of that was medroxyprogesterone acetate or MPA, which was launched as a pill for as an oral for pets in 1963, and then came to the states in 1964 under the name Depo-Provera. And that, that came here as an injection. It actually worked quite well for a cessation of, of, uh, of fertility for about six months, but it had some definite consequences. And based on that, we had essentially an epidemic of pyrometro here. And there was a real backlash about that. People were not, the, 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 um, the profession was not pleased at all. Um, right about that same time, magistral, magistral acetate came under the brand name Ovaban. And while it, it did not have the same issues deeper, very, it had similar ones. And I would say overall, it left kind of a bad taste in veterinarians' uh, mouth about the whole concept of non-surgical contraception. However, and, and we, we by then you know, were really perfecting surgery, really liking our spay-neuter surgery, like we'll, we'll take that, thank you, we'll go with that. Um, and really hadn't come back to that until mm -hmm. later on, which I'll, I'll talk about. However, in Europe, um, spay-neuter surgery is far less well accepted. In fact, in several Scandinavian countries, it's been outlawed. Um, that is restored, but for quite a number of years, it was considered an elective surgery that should not be done unless the health of the animal depended on it. So they were much more motivated to see if this could work and did a, quite a bit more fine-tuning on the use of hormonal contraceptives. And actually, it's, it, um, those are in use overseas. They've, they've doctored up the doses. They've learned a lot more about when in the estrus cycle to administer it. Um, and they're fairly happy with it. Um, so it's interesting that there's been that, that shift. Um, we, in general, still feel like there's more side effects than we would want to deal with. And, and for our purposes, there, it tends to need a lot more compliance by, um, by a pet owner in terms of when during the estrus cycle to begin this, and, and we pretty much don't deal with it. However, I bring it up because, um, because it's come back. We, we also, maybe people may be familiar with check drops. Is anybody any experience with that? Okay. So it's an androgen as well. It causes some masculinization, but still is used in, in the greyhound field and, and whatnot. Um, it's pretty much not, not been used much for a while. Um, so, so we hadn't seen much of that in the States at all until the return of feral stat. And has anybody here known of or heard of feral stat? No? OK. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so as I mentioned here, so it's, it's generally not considered acceptable for widespread population management um, with, with the exception of, of this product. This was launched by a Connecticut uh, veterinarian in 2001 and was marketed on an increasing basis up until about 2008. It's a very low dose magistral acetate proge uh, progesterone and um, it's, it's a challenge because the, the experience in Europe is typically at slightly higher doses than this. And so it's very difficult to look at the research and find a, a corollary as to what you might, might expect on either eff eff efficacy or on safety. Um, anecdotally, he, he, was, he was marketing this probably pretty illegally because it was all over the states to um, over the internet. It's, a, it's MA uh, compounded in a milk powder for palatability to be put out on a, um, on a weekly basis for people's feral cat colonies. Pretty much specifically marketing this for feral cats. And um, it kind of disappeared. It's, it's no longer marketed. I think he kind of came afoul of, of FDA, who finally started focusing on him. But he was very well-intentioned, very well-intentioned. And, um, and, and many of the colony caretakers are calling us, asking how in the world they can get it back because it worked for them. Um, so it's, it, it becomes a challenge. It's probably something that, not, that could not get regulatory approval because of it being tended to be put out as, as bait. But it's, it's very intriguing to us because anecdotally people seem to see it working. What you see there on the right is a, a journal article uh, published in March of this year by uh, a Cornell resident, shelter med grad, uh, Dr. Mike Greenberg, uh, as lead author. 
that really pulls together all of the research on this product. So I encourage you, if you get questions about it or are interested, to read this new journal article in the Veterinary Journal because it pulls together. We're still very intrigued about how this might be able to be a tool for feral cat management, but it certainly has challenges. Other things you should know about that are out there is this contraceptive implant that is marketed by Verbac in the EU. It's also available in, the, in Australia and New Zealand. It is marketed for male dogs. You remember that cascade? This is one of those that, as you know, when you interrupt GnRH, you're dealing with both male and female. So this, although it's been marketed and commercialized for male dogs, also works in females. Um, and it also works in cats. So we'll talk a little bit about the opportunity uh, for that. It is, um, it's marketed in a six and a 12 month effectiveness, and it can be used for any age and can be repeated. And you see in the, in the EU, the, price, the, 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 co the pricing is around that for the six month version. So it's, it's also a bit pricey on our side for a lot of the, the tools that we're, we're looking for. But this is a basis of some really interesting work that's being looked at as in higher doses, it may actually be possible to get um, some permanent results on that. And in cats, it looks like it's probably gonna last about three years. Um, I, I bring this up because it, at our symposium, we really delved into some interesting research people are doing with this. This is research looking at this for female dogs. This is um, a trial on the First Nation reserves in southern Alberta, Canada, by Dr. Judith Sampson French, who you see here. She, she got this year's Humane Award from the Canadian VMA and has just um, uh, released this really, really interesting book. She is um, working in an area where the, the conditions for dogs are very difficult. They can get to 20 degrees below zero in the winters. They're tending to cycle twice, sometimes have puppies in the fall where you have that terrible, terrible situation. They tend to have very short lifespans. And she is using this product as like a one minute treatment on the reserves that is, that is um, it lasts about, she's thinking, it's looking about lasting about 18 months to two years and it's saving though them at least a couple cycles of, of giving birth um, and jeopardizing their health and the health of their pups. So it's an interesting application of this product in the field where it's in a place where it is very, very difficult to bring surgery to. She gave a fabulous breakfast talk, which you can listen to if you're interested in, um, and her book is really intriguing. So Gonacon, something else I want to tell you about, it is an immunocontraceptive, um, so it's a vaccine. Um, it is, who has heard about Gonacon here? Any? Oh, go, go, several of you, terrific. Okay, so it's, it's been approved in the United States for deer and also for wild horses. And it's used in females um, and offers about a one-year contraceptive for them. It's got potential for, for dogs, for cats, for ferrets, for rabbits. And one thing that is intriguing, it just actually got what's called indexed approval through the FDA for ferrets here for adrenal cortical disease. It also provides contraceptive effect. That's one of the ways it's treating the adrenal cortical disease. But they're very cautious about not having it labeled for contraception because of just sensitivities with the FDA um, and not wanting to overstep their bounds as a company and what it can be used for. But for you to know, it is actually available now for, for ferrets. Um, positives about this, it's probably quite, quite affordable um, when scaled up. So I, I put this slide in here, especially for those of you with scientific background to kind of see what it is. So you can see, so it, it Im immunizes um, against GnRH. You can kind of see what it's created um, through. The microbacterium avium is part of what helps it boost the immune response. Um, but still in, in, and there's been a variable response. They've found in deer that it contracepts at least a year. Oftentimes if they're retreated, they find that that tends to go, tends to extend the, the, um, the contraceptive effect even to possibly permanent. And I'll show you what the, the results in cats, which are showing even more duration. So this, this causes, because of how it acts, this causes essentially you know, cessation of, the, um, of sexual behaviors for the duration of the time and fertility. So this is Dr. Julie Levy, who many of you probably know. This is her study of gonacon in cats over five years. So she, you can see the sham-treated cats. That what this shows, in, in kind of at a glance, is the time to pregnancy offered in breeding trials of cats that were um, vaccinated with gonacon, a single treatment. 
So you can see what you end up having is a variable, which is typical of vaccines, right? Kind of a variable effect depending on the animal. On average, it was about two and a half years before the cats um, got pregnant again. About 20% of her cats were still contracepted at the end of five years, and, some, and a couple of them returned to fertility closer to the, to the one year mark. So this is one of those challenges where we're, we're gonna expect some variability in response, but perhaps as an, an option for feral cats in the field, this may be an option when you're doing a population level of control um, as opposed to a specific for that individual cat. Um, she had some injection site reactions, which, um, which oddly enough came about very uh, kind of a late occurrence, around 24 months, in a portion of the cats. They were non-painful, they resolved, but it's still a little bit worrisome, and, and certainly in cats where we're worried about vaccine-related sarcomas, it's, it's, it's cautionary, but it seems to be, a certain level of injection site reaction seems to be somewhat, um, somewhat critical as part of their immune response, which is, which is kind of tough. Gonacon in dogs, there was a study about 10 years in three male dogs where there was an unacceptable injection site reaction shortly uh, effect shortly following the, the treatment. Um, and so we pretty much said this is probably not gonna be appropriate for dogs, but they've done a lot of reformulation of this product and they just completed some tests in Mexico that are gonna be published in the, the journal Vaccine later this year. And by a reformulation, they were able to reduce to getting very, very minimal injection site reactions, which were considered acceptable. Um, and so we're actually looking for further duration studies on this to see how long this is gonna last in dogs. But this may have some opportunity for probably free roaming dogs internationally, or like the dogs Dr. French is, is treating, where you, you have a shorter lifespan, or where you're gonna have access to be able to retreat the dogs um, to keep them, keep them in an in infertile status. Um, there's a vaccine trial going on in Nepal with this. And, um, and, and actually, intriguingly about that, that is APHIS, or, or USDA, in conjunction with the, the, the uh, government in Britain, who is, is working on this. So it's interesting, the, the players that are getting involved, um, as well as an animal welfare group and the veterinary college there in Nepal. So they are, they are um, working on that. There is a trial that's going to be happening here in Oklahoma that you should know about. Um, and that is the USDA working with um, veterinarians and a local uh, animal welfare organization. They are planning a 300 dog study of, of community dogs on a native reservation that they're gonna be tracking over a year to try to understand the duration that they're seeing in that, that type of a dog. Um, and then you can see they've got several other things. They are, they are act actively looking for a licensing partner to proceed to see how this can be put into place to make the best use of this technology. So switching back to cats, cats are really an ACC and D priority for the US, especially feral and free roaming cats because of their, um, because of the animal welfare issues and because of their contribution to shelter intake. Um, and so we're intrigued by these potential candidates for what we're calling a three year contraceptive in, uh, effect in cats. And that's where we feel like we would achieve something that would be of a valuable level. Um, so Gonacon, which we talked about, is, is one of those, and the Suprolerin, which we talked about only briefly, but in cats tends to work even longer than dogs, is something else that's being looked at. And so you'll probably be hearing more about that in, in time to come. Okay, so switching, so another category then is, is chemical castration. Dr. Wien's gonna talk quite a bit more about um, Zuterin, which is the FDA approved option we have to use now. People have tried a number of different types about that, and it's actually already approved in, in a number of countries. So I'm gonna leave that for now and let him bring you up to speed on that. So what will the future hold? Maybe this, I don't know. Um, so our Superman is Dr. Gary Michelson with the Found Animals Foundation. And uh, he launched his foundation uh, in, in 2007 and shortly thereafter launched the Michelson Prize in grants in 2008. And as some of you may know, so that is a $25 million prize um, for the entity that develops something that fits their, their criteria, which is somewhat similar to the ones we talked about in the beginning, but it's a, they're looking for a single treatment, affordable, permanent, 
male and female sterilant, non-surgical sterilant, that can be delivered in the field. So that's created a wonderful large carrot that has drawn really interesting researchers to the field. And the, um, thankfully, they also have a $50 million grant pool. So that has enabled what's currently now about 26 different researchers and proposals to be in progress um, with about almost $12 million in funding. And it's been, it's been, I mean, it's been really, really exciting to see the new talent that's been brought to this field. Um, and I think it's going to, you know, I, unfortunately, there's actually a, there's a lot of work to be done in understanding some of the basics about dog and cat reproduction, as it, as it. Uh, um, as it relates to suppressing it. So there's, they're doing a lot of that basic work, but there's some exciting stuff. And these are some of the, the categories. You will hear people, if, if you'd like to, to check out some of the things from the symposium, speaking on, we've got, had about, I think, eight different researchers from the Michelson Prize funded things, as well as other researchers that are working outside um, that grants program talking about what they're working on here. I would say many of them are still yeah. many years away from being commercial, you know, put through commercialization and ready, but they're making, they're making progress. Um, and if you have questions about that, maybe Mark, Dr. Thompson can answer some questions there. These are some of the categories that, that we see. So, um, so the last area that, that we work on is um, exploring and advancing related needs. And um, one of those is population modeling. What we, we were starting to, we had this interest in a three-year contraception and thinking that that would be valuable. Um, and what it led us to was recognizing that we don't really know the best way to deploy surgical sterilization to accomplish our goals. You know, especially in, you know, looking at feral cats, we don't know how many, who we actually have to reach out there in order to reduce shelter intake, in order to achieve the, our objectives for animal welfare in the community. And it is, um, and that's, it's challenging. If you don't know your, your goals, it's hard to know how to measure how you're doing against your goals. So we, at the same time, at our 2010 symposium, we had this very brainy, wildlife um, biologist that was with us, we were actually sharing results that Dr. Margaret Slater from the ASPCA and her colleague had done that were modeling, looking at how we might expect a three-year contraceptive to compare if we were able to put it in the field. And it was looking pretty positive. He said, you know, the wildlife field has much better tools for doing this sophisticated modeling than, than you guys are using. You know, you should try, you know, check out some of the stuff that we're doing and seeing if you could uh, deploy that for dogs and for cats. And so we, we held a think tank then to try to figure out how to draw the right people in wildlife um, biology into this field. We, uh, we, had a, um, we, we had a think tank and out of that we actually created a population model which is just being prepared now for um, for uh, submission to uh, a journal. And out of that, with the current phase, we've created kind of the guidance and practical advice out of that. Um, I, I don't have much more about that in this presentation because it kind of launches out of the field. But um, what, it's, what I think will be really helpful about that is helping shelters and, uh, and local community groups set goals so that we can actually see if we're achieving them. And, and one of the key ones is knowing how much surgery do we need to do, what should be our targets, and how do we add on new tools that we have so we have right, the, the best mix of, of tools in the, in the community. And so by, um, within this next year, I think we're gonna be actually being able to do some grants and some partnership for more field level learning about um, what the population modeling is gonna show. Um, the other area is, is marking techniques. Now, in, um, for, for feral cats, obviously the ear tip has become a, a universal sig a symbol of sterilization, and that is used internationally with dogs as well. Um, but when we're marking dogs without surgery, if we don't need anesthesia, how are we, we, we're not gonna be able to clip a part of their, their ear off. Um, and what if we're using something that's temporary, that they're going to recover, you know, they're going to resume fertility in three years. We wouldn't want to mark them as permanently sterilized and then not know 
that they're, um, they're going to be coming back into uh, to cycling. So we realized that we need some better methods of being able to kind of humanely, effectively mark um, animals. So, so we've been undertaking a project for the last year where we've looked at all of the existing methods that are used in companion animals, in livestock, in wildlife, um, and what might be applicable for dogs and for cats. Um, and again, this is, this is primarily targeted at kind of a free roaming population. Thankfully, with, with own dogs and cats, we can use microchips and we can record quite a lot of information on those. And already with Zootering, you can include the information about whether a dog has been Zootered on a microchip. Um, new technologies, we will assumably also have that opportunity to be able, and especially for timing. But it, that's more difficult when you don't have a pet owner to be able to tell you, or you don't have a, you can't get close enough to an animal to, to scan their microchip. So we're looking at something that would be a visual marking, as well as something that would let us um, um, get more data. So we, we launched actually a, a really interesting inocentive challenge. Has anybody heard of inocentive? should look up or do www.innocentive.com. Fascinating, fascinating field. It is um, crowdsourcing of ideas and innovation. It's, it's focused primarily on life sciences areas and in, on thorny kind of technical challenges. Some of you brainy folks that might want to make some extra money, you can compete to win money um, from that. And in fact, they have 270,000 solvers around the world that are registered and are reviewing um, different challenges that are posted by companies, individuals. Um, and there are prizes everything, everywhere up from $500 to millions of dollars on there. And um, we did an inocentive challenge, which was very affordable. It cost us about $2,500. Um, it, uh, it was a one month time and over that time we had about a hundred, no actually a hundred separate solutions offered for how we might humanely and innovatively mark dogs and cats and it really helped us get out of the box in, in looking at that. So um, we, uh, we, we then after that drew folks, a, a wide array of folks into a think tank and came up with a consensus on a project to design a a really kind of more novel earmarking method, um, external with or without RFID that would be externally mounted, that would that code into it visual information about treatment type and date. So we're, we're pretty excited about that and we're right at the stage of kind of designing it and recruiting partners. So if you want to learn more about that. Um, so how can you get more involved if you're interested? Please um, download that ebook and check out the symposium proceedings. Um, we sh I don't know if it's circulated around. There should be a, a sign-up sheet coming if you'd like to give us your business card or your email. And we, we do periodic email newsletters and we'll keep you apprised of advances in this field. Um, we have a Facebook page like, like most folks. Um, uh, feel free, we'd love to have your organization join our organizational partner and our organizational partners program. And if you, we are always intrigued about new board members and new scientific advisors. So if you have a particular interest in this field and, and expertise to share, we would love to, to talk to you about that. So, great, and there's my contact information and I think we can now.